The great philosopher Kobe Bryant once said, quote, Trust me, setting things up right from the beginning will avoid a ton of tears and heartache. Close quote. I like that. You know, we can stop tanking in the NBA, but not with the current thinking. Please have an open mind and hear me out. No lottery system can fix tanking. The NBA mistakenly thinks that using ping pong balls in a lottery to inject chance into the draft order system will disincentivize teams from tanking. This will never work. Why? Because all 30 teams in the NBA have, adva- have embraced advanced analytics. Think about it. This is a league that embraces certain shots, certain defenses, etc., based on micro advantages that are sometimes measured in fractions of percentage points. So, of course, they're going to play the odds, no matter how small, to get a better draft position. The NBA's draft based lottery system is just wrong-headed. Let's look at it from three perspectives, and you'll see what I mean. Perspective number one. Right now, the worst three teams in the NBA are the Detroit Pistons, the San Antonio Spurs, and the Houston Rockets. Therefore, each has a 14% chance of getting the number one pick in the 2023 draft. The NBA is not the Hunger Games. No one cares if the odds are not ever in your favor. All teams care about is whatever advantage they might get and whatever they can do to get an advantage. If you're going to miss the playoffs anyway, then tanking is just statistically better for your team than Accordingly, no matter the odds, no lottery-based system will ever actually disincentivize tanking. Number two. Then there are the middling lottery teams like the Utah Jazz. This season, the Jazz were the ninth worst team in the NBA out of 30 teams. So they have a 4.5% chance of getting the number one pick in the NBA uh, uh, draft in 2023. Now, most of us, we would say 4.5% is terrible odds, but think like an NBA franchise. NBA teams think 4.5% is great. After all, less than 2% of all full court heaves at the buzzer go in the basket. Nevertheless, every NBA team expects their players to heave the ball full court at the buzzer. Not because the odds for that shot are great, but because there is a chance that it could help their team. That's their thinking, and they're right. For the Utah Jazz, their 4.5% chance of getting the first pick in the lottery is more than double the odds of a full court heave, so they're fine with it. Broadcasters, writers, analysts, fans, players, franchises, and the NBA front office just need to embrace this truth, that no matter how remote the odds, the teams will play those odds if there's any possibility that they could gain an odd and an advantage by doing so. Consequently, every possible lottery-based system that the NBA could concoct will always be gamed by teams. Any lottery, any lottery will always be incentive for tanking. Number three, the 2023 Dallas Mavericks gave us a really interesting case study in tanking. In case you don't know, the Mavs sat most of their stars for their final game of the regular season. And by the way, they were fined $750,000 for doing it. But guess what? Deliberately losing that one game increased Dallas's odds at getting the first pick by 66.7%. If they win the game, then they have a 1.8% chance of getting the first pick. By losing the game, they got a 3% chance at getting the first pick. The NBA can investigate teams and find them all at once, but it won't disincentivize tanking. Instead, it will incentivize teams to get stealthier, to get sneakier and trickier about their tanking. That's not good for the league. Honestly, it is impossible to design a lottery system that is fair for the teams that are struggling while at the same time disincentivizing tanking. Because by definition, a lottery gives teams a chance at getting something they haven't actually earned. The solution to tanking is to replace the lottery part of the first round with a system that that gives Uh, incentive for teams to be as well run as they possibly can. 
That makes sense, right? So this is what I propose. Replace the NBA lottery with premium selection. I'll explain what that means in a minute. Right now, the first round of the NBA is divided into two parts. The lottery, which are the 14 bottom teams who missed the playoffs. They're in the lottery. And then the rest of the first round, the 16 teams that did make the playoffs, then get to pick from the remaining players in the order of their regular season records. This draft order is somewhat modified due to trades. For example, this year, the Utah Jazz get Minnesota's first pick, along with their own pick in the first round. So they, this year, have two picks in the top 15. It is time to acknowledge the reality, though, that the NBA now has three tiers of teams because they changed their playoff system. First, there are the 12 teams that clinch berths in the playoffs. Second, there are the eight teams that qualify for the play-in tournament. And then third, there are the bottom 10 teams that had no postseason at all. Now, hopefully we all agree that the NBA shouldn't punish play-in teams for winning and getting into the playoffs. That's a good thing. It's competition. That's what sport is all about. That means for draft purposes, the eight play-in teams should be included with the other 10 teams that didn't clinch a playoff berth. Let's call those bottom 18 teams the premium qualified teams. And again, I'll explain why in a minute. So now, instead of a lottery, the first part of the first round of the draft should be divided into these two parts. One, premium selection, and two, the rest of the first round. Okay, Tom, what is premium selection? Glad you asked. As you know, in college basketball, high school prospects get to choose the college they play for, the team that they play for. And in that system, the premium high school players get the best choices. Not only has this system worked fine for decades, but the fact that this year, the first, second, and third seeded teams never made it to the final four demonstrates the relative parity that can be achieved when you allow premium players to choose their teams. Well, that is how premium selection, the premium selection portion of the NBA draft should work. In the premium selection portion of the first round, each of the top 15 premium players get to choose from from among the 18 premium qualified teams which team he will play for. Then, when all 15 premium players have chosen a team, the remaining 15 teams in the first round will be Uh, drafted um, according to regular season records, the way that we've been doing it. So instead of 14 players uh, chosen by teams by a draft, we're talking about 15 players getting to choose their team from the bottom 18 teams. Hopefully Hopefully that's clear enough. So how are the 15 premium players chosen from among all the players who declare for a draft? By the premium qualified teams, of course. All premium qualified teams will have a deadline to submit their list of their top 15 players that they are interested in. And those lists are binding, meaning when their turn comes to choose a player, if any of the players on the list that they they submitted to the NBA head office are still available in the draft, they must choose the highest preference player from their own list. This is necessary to keep teams from putting players on their list that they're not actually interested in so that they can force premium players that they are interested in to not make the top 15, to fall out of the top 15 so that they can draft them. The NBA would then use the lists of the 18 premium qualified teams to identify the top 15 players and the order with which these players would get to choose their teams. So let's talk about Victor Wimbanyama. Suppose Victor Wimbanyama is the top premium player this year. That means Victor would get the first choice of where he would play from from among the following teams. The Pistons, Rockets, Hornets, Trailblazers, Magic, Wizards, Jazz, Pacers, Mavericks, Thunder, Magic, the Jazz again because they have two top 15 picks, uh, the Pelicans, and the Hawks. Obviously, in this system, Tanking is the dumbest thing a team could do 
to make themselves appealing to a premium player. You don't, premium players don't want to go to a tanking team. They want to compete. They want to win. They want to showcase who they are. They want to get those rings. In fact, to the contrary, NBA teams would need to do everything they could all season long to make themselves as attractive to premium players as possible. Basically, NBA teams would have to do everything they're already doing anyway to lure free agents to their teams because those are the exact same things that premium rookies will look for as well. So say you are the Houston Rockets. Houston is the fourth largest city in the United States. So the Rockets would no doubt use their market size as a talking point to persuade Victor to come play for them. Then again, even though Salt Lake City is the 119th largest city in the United States, the Jazz have Lowry Markkinen, a front runner for most improved player, an all-star, and a fantastic one-two punch on offense with Victor, right? Imagine those two seven-footers attacking from the perimeter and in. Also, the Utah Jazz have a Rookie of the Year candidate in Walker Kessler, a seven-footer that plays inside, that wants to play inside, that wants to rebound and block shots and play everywhere that Victor might not necessarily prefer to play. In other words, regardless of market size, teams have advantages that they could use to lure uh, premium draft prospects to them, premium rookie players, and they would... Um, use those advantages in their interactions with them before the draft. The premium selection would both help struggling teams and it would reward them for running themselves well and trying very hard to be good all season long. That's good for the players. That's good for the teams. That's good for the fans. And it's, it's just good for the NBA. Now, let's talk about the Durant Hayward factor. Ask any Oklahoma City Thunder fan, how it felt to use a young how it felt to lose a young Kevin Durant to free agency to the Golden State Warriors. Or asking a Utah Jazz fan how it felt to watch Gordon Hayward announce that he was ditching Utah seconds after becoming a free agent. With premium selection, rookies will have chosen their teams. That increases the odds that a young free agent may stick around with their first team. Look at it this way: Donovan Mitchell by all reports, was going to leave the Utah Jazz anyway when he became a free agent. That's a major reason why the Jazz traded him. Isn't it better for teams to invest in developing rookies that actually want to be there? In conclusion, lotteries will always incentivize tanking. They're just dumb. They're wrongheaded. So dump lotteries and instead replace them with a system that's already proven itself for decades in college basketball, namely a system that allows premium prospects to choose where they want to play. That will kill tanking always and forever, and it'll give NBA teams every incentive to always be at their best. Thanks for listening.